All right, hey guys, welcome back to the second video. In this one, uh, we are just going to go over the four-ish waves. There's some debate about whether we're in the fourth wave or still um, the third wave. And ultimately, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, what's more important is to look at the progression in terms of the issues that, uh, that feminist scholars have been um, talking about and, and that their activism has been engaged with over the course of time. So, uh, the first wave um, really begins in 1848, which I do have up there, um, and that happens in Seneca Falls, which is the first women's rights convention, to my knowledge, in world history, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about when you consider the fact that I I'm not aware of a society that had gender equality in the history of the world. So if you think about the fact that we have gone for, as we talked about in the very, very beginning of this course, 300,000 years of human history, and there hasn't been a big political movement for gender equality, at least not one that I'm aware of, um, that's pretty significant. What it suggests is uh, a couple of things, I guess. One is the the power of patriarchy or of, um, of an androcentric culture. Um, both the power of both the power of the culture to kind of hold people in the places that they are familiar with, um, but also the power of people in power to exert that power on people who are subordinate to them. Um, so anyway, we get to 1848, and there's the uh, the first women's rights movement in Seneca Falls, and this is mainly a political movement. Not exclusively, but if you think about the things that they are um, that they are protesting, they are the fact that women can't vote. Well, you knew that, right? Because the Nineteenth Amendment was ratified in nineteen twenty. Um, they couldn't serve in public office. That kind of makes sense because they couldn't vote. Um, they couldn't serve on juries. That's one that not a lot of people know. Even if the woman, even if a woman is the defendant, and we're supposed to have a jury of our peers, women were not allowed to serve on juries. They weren't allowed to practice law or medicine or theology. Um, if a woman was married, she could not hold property in her no, in her own name. Um, she couldn't claim wages uh, from work outside the home as her own. Um, uh, and she couldn't even sign her own will. But I think one of the biggest issues in terms of motivating, I shouldn't say one of the biggest issues, one of the ones that was most appalling to me, so it doesn't mean it was something that was super motivating to the women who gathered there, was the fact that um, the husband had the right to beat his wife in order to preserve order in the Commonwealth. So in other words, the idea that it is part of the common good for women to be in their place. I think that's a really significant thing to think about. Um, this first wave of feminism lasts until 1920. So we're talking about 70 years of women saying, we need to have political power and of men saying, no, we're not doing that. Um, so that is, and the analysis, the analysis and one of the first feminist theories that we will deal with, I believe is cultural feminism, makes a big argument. It analyzes um, society on the basis of this inequality and says, you know, uh, and this is just foreshadowing where we're going to be going. It says, you know, America would be better off with women, um, with women having some political power because they make the argument women are gentler, women are less aggressive, women are caring. And so it makes these sort of essentialist, this is how women are arguments to, to justify getting women into political office. But if you think about it in the reverse, the first analysis of, um, of gender in sociology is really coming from this idea of how do we, how do we justify getting women the right to vote? Um, anyway, that's the first wave. Uh, women get the right to vote in 1920, and then we move into the 1960s. Um, this is kickstarted a little bit by Betty Friedan's book, which I believe came out in the 1950s, called The Feminine Mystique. Um, 
And it makes the argument that women in the 1950s supposedly have it all because American society is crushing it in the 50s if you factor out racial discrimination. In terms of, which, which I kind of said as an aside to, to kind of make the point that we absolutely factored that out. That wasn't a big concern of American society. Um, when we look back to the 1950s, what we see is a lot of wealth, a pretty big middle class. And Betty Friedan writes this book about the fact that, uh, at least for white women, everything seems to be, she seems to be having what she's been told she wants, which is to be a housewife. And Betty Friedan said it's, it's stultifying. There's, it, it isn't stultifying necessarily for everyone, but for her, for women who want something different than that, not being able to do it is incredibly alienating. So this is one of those points that I was making in the last lecture about the fact that if we study society from the perspective of the generic person, we miss this. We miss the fact that society is failing half of the population and you know, possibly more than that if you say, well, everything's supposed to be rosy, but half the population is upset because they don't have the same, in this case, economic rights that the other half does. Maybe there's something going on. Feminism, by having that perspective of, well, okay, so what's going on with the women? Everything seems to be great. What's going on with the women? Well, it turns out women are being ripped off of opportunities. It gives you an insight into maybe things aren't quite as great underneath the surface of this society. So we move into the 1960s and 1970s, and that is all the way up through the 1990s that fight for economic equality. Um, uh, sorry, what, what just went through my mind was, and, and as I said in my introductory lecture, we haven't completely won that fight yet. We also haven't completely won this fight yet either, right? If women are making up less than 50% of elected officials, obviously we don't have complete political equality either. Um, so all of these waves, you don't want to think of them necessarily as one of them completely goes away, even though I've put end lines on the end of that. That's not the best way of thinking about it. Um, so second wave is about economic equality. We've got at least, at least political rights that are equal after the first wave, but women don't have the same rights to work. So we end up with a second wave of feminism devoted to economic equality. Then we move into the third wave. We haven't reached complete economic equality yet, but the third wave is about cultural equality and in a couple of different ways. First of all, at this point in the 1990s through the early 2000s, so we start to get into your lifetimes here, um, there was an expanding awareness that feminism that didn't look at things intersectionally, we'll look at intersectional feminism toward the end of this week. Intersectionality means we can't just look at the dimension of gender because a white woman's experience is gonna be different than a black woman's experience, which is gonna be different than uh, a Latinx woman's experience, which is going to also be different. Any one of those is gonna depend on whether the woman is heterosexual and cisgender or not those things, homosexual and or transgender. So we start getting into this idea of different definitions of the person and how those lead to different ways of being oppressed. So that's one way in which, uh, in which this is a more cultural, um, uh, a wave that is more interested in cultural issues. Uh, the second way is that uh, a lot of attention starts to be given to definitions of beauty definitions of womanhood, um, and the fact that those things are culturally constructed and that they have a way of oppressing women as well. So remember when I started out talking about this intersectionality, I talked about how white women's experience is different than black or brown women. Um, but with this attention to definitions of womanhood, we end up with the realization that as, you know, all, pretty much every woman who's watching this video will say, or uh, will be aware, um, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, even for white women, to look a certain way and to change the way you look. And that idea, that cultural idea of, um, of 
beauty of it being a, a standard that you have to that you are supposed to live up to is oppressive in and of itself. Okay, so that's the third wave. Lots of awareness of cultural ideas. Um, and now here's where things get a little bit debatable. I'm sorry, this has gone a little bit longer than I intended, but this is important stuff. It's worth knowing. The fourth wave. Um, the argument is that a fourth wave, and this is where it's, it's a little bit arguable. Some people say this is a continuation of the third. It's not super important whether it's third or fourth, so much as the idea that this personal, uh, um, issues of personal oppression come to the fore. And this comes to the fore, um, in my reading of it, first with the whole Gamergate scandal. Um, Gamergate was the situation where, um, where women gamers, women programmers, women who wrote about gaming were being threatened in really horrific ways online. So in some ways, this kind of coincides with the age of the internet. Um, threats of sexual assault, definite sexual harassment. That sort of is the beginning of it. And this consciousness that we can have political equality, we can have economic equality, we could even have cultural equality for, um, for women, but it doesn't really matter if men can still, just on a personal basis, threaten and treat women horribly. Gamergate spins into the Donald Trump presidency, where um, his kind of famous Hollywood access uh, comments about being able to grab women, to bragging about sexually assaulting women, and how that was not disqualifying for him, which if you think about is kind of, I mean, incredible in a sickening way, that a person can say, yeah, I, if you're a star, you are allowed to sexually assault women, and that a whole bunch of people would still vote for him, including women. Um, and then we move from the, that Trump issue into the Harvey Weinstein Me Too movement. And again, it is about, um, it is about the, the fact that even women with power, even women who are economically powerful, who are at the, front of our, at the forefront of our culture, who people would say are you know, living up to this feminine ideal, are still being harassed and in some cases assaulted. Um, there's still the, a different type of work to be done. That's the argument of the fourth wave. Okay, I think that that is everything I have to do with that. So we've kind of contextualized and brought ourselves up to, uh, up to the contemporary period. And now what we're gonna do in the next video is talk about the four main questions that all of the feminist theories are going to ask. Any feminist theory is going to ask these four questions, but we're at 13 minutes, so I will save that for the next video.